Uh, the center examines the impact of independent media on journalism, democracy, society, and participatory cultures. Our very special event this afternoon here, and I'm sure it's evening for many of you, who owns the story documentary in Africa, will be a 90 minute round table with distinguished filmmakers, producers, researchers, and cultural activists probing the aesthetics, economics, politics, problems, and solutions of documentary across the African continent. The Global Doc Media series is a collaboration between the BFI Doc Media Book Editorial Collective, the Park Center for Independent Media, the Fing Finger Lakes of Environmental Film Festival, uh, Documentary Africa, and Cine Documental Argen Argentina, with additional support from the uh, Latin American Studies program at college. We are very honored to be collaborating with D Documentary Africa in Nairobi, Kenya, to mount this important roundtable discussion. I'm also very excited that uh, this international conversation will generate a lot of interest uh, among our students, faculty, and the community uh, who are uh, participating this afternoon. And I'm sure everyone, including me, will learn a lot from this event. My colleague here, in the Park School at Ithaca College, Dr. Patricia Zimmerman, Charles A. Dana, Professor of Screen Studies at Ithaca College and a member of the BFI Doc Media book editorial team uh, will share the format for today's roundtable. Over to you, Dr. Zimmerman. Thank you, uh, Raza, for that very generous introduction. And thank you again to our partners for this important roundtable, the Park Center for Independent Media, Cine Documentale, and Documentary Africa. The Global Doc Media Series explores ongoing international debates in documentary practice, history, and theory across platforms that are unresolved and still forming. Uh, it is part of an ongoing research and international dialogues for the BFI Doc Media book currently in development. The editorial collective and team for this book includes Brian Winston in the United Kingdom, Gail Vanstone in Canada, Hend Alawadi in Kuwait, and Thomas Crowder, um, Argentina, and the U.S., and, my, and myself in the U.S. Today's session uh, will become part of this book. Our format today will feature about 45 minutes of discussion among the panelists, then 20 minutes of questions from the audience. Um, we ask that you as a participant kindly join us live by raising your digital hand. We will conclude our session then with some takeaways from each of the panelists. The moderator for today's very special roundtable is Austin Niamba, the communications officer at Na Documentary Africa in Nairobi, Kenya. He was the host of The Great Debaters Contest, a national TV show that aired on Citizen TV and KBC Channel One. He was also the main content creator and moderator of The Great Debaters Contest, Connect Edition. Multi-talented across many media, uh, Austin is also a music producer at Mad Royal Entertainment. Welcome, Austin. Uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Patty, for that amazing introduction. And um, well, it's quite amazing. Not even just quite, it's very amazing and uh, wonderful that we are able to collaborate on this. And I'll just give you a little bit of a, a sizzle about our lovely panel today. We have wonderful, we, we've basically picked out one of the best people we think that can bring out our topic today, which is who owns the story because they are experienced in the continent and they have, they're also very accomplished. Uh, starting us off with Howard Esman, a filmmaker, a writer, director, and producer. She was original, she originally directed theater and television drama, and she is also the co-founder of Manyata Screenings, a biannual film program showcasing shorts from Greater East Africa. We have Judy Kibinge, a very, very, very famous name in the film space in this continent. If you've not heard it, I'm not 
not sure if you've been around Africa that much. Diki Binge is a filmmaker who began her career in advertising. She has won the first non-expatriate, she was the first non-expatriate creative director of a multinational regional agency East Africa, and that worked with brands such as Coca-Cola and most founded, which is the East African Documentary Film Fund that has been a home for many in the documentary film space within the East African region. Judy has also Academy of Motion Picture and Sciences, basically the Oscars. So you have, you, you're, you're in great, you're in the presence of greatness. We also have Idrissa Morika Pai, is an award-winning Beninese filmmaker whose films have been screened at international festivals such as Berlin, Rotterdam, Vienna, Milano, and all the, all, all the best film festivals within Europe and the world in general. Idrisu, uh, through his social documentaries, tackles post-colonial African societies, Africa's African societies, migration, and diaspora. He has also received uh, the Dutch Prince Klaus Award for artistic achievements. And he is the assistant professor in the Department of Media, Arts, and Science and Studies at Ithaca. Uh, we also have Josh Momunga. He has been involved in the film industry in Kenya since 2009 and believes film is the most important medium of bringing social change. Josh has, was one of the fundamental pieces of actually making sure that DACA came to, came to be because he was involved within its initial research and strategy and he currently serves as DACA's strategy and finance lead. Thank you, Josh. And lastly, we have Mohammed Seydoma, a renowned filmmaker, cultural operator, and executive director of DACA. And Mohammed has also been engaged with the African Heritage Project, which in this sense plays into our topic because they are trying to restore 50 African films of historical, cultural, and artistic significance. And he's cut his teeth in the festival circuit. And he is currently under his screen, sorry, his film, The Red Card, which premiered at IDFA, is currently screening. And therefore, please go check it out. And that is my segue to introduce Mohammed to say something small about Docker. Hello. Mohammed, could you join us, please? Hello, so I think I've got the flow. Hello, thank you to the people like Faka, Patricia, uh, um, and uh, her colleagues. Thank you for taking part in this. So Documentary Africa is a Pan-African organization. It was established in 2018 in Nairobi, Kenya, and it's a proactive response to the needs of the filmmaker. This is one of, this is one of many Pan-African uh, organization, film organization, that expressly uh, trying to direct its work, its mission, its goals to the needs that have been assessed through the report by the documentary filmmakers and the producers. It was set up by documentary producers, among them Judy, among them Stephen Markovich, among them Salim Brahimi and others, you know, you name it. So basically lots of experience on the documentary front on the continent and globally and um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they started to think about what could we do for the documentary genre on the continent. It's a pas en pauvre, I will say, I will use a French expression to express how documentary on the genre has been treated on the continent. Um, even in the major festivals like Fespaco or Durban or Qatar, documentary has been always satellite. So what we do at DOK, we give funds, so which is basic, so producers, they come to us for production money, development money, post-production impact, but we also try to, to fill some gaps. Uh, there are numerous gaps when it comes to the filmmaking industry on the continent, spe specifically with documentary. So we're trying to fill the gaps by uh, helping doc organization to set up the workshop, the film labs, and to be able to give them uh, access to mentors, and to specialists in whatever fields they're looking for. But what we're also trying to be at Documentary Africa, trying to be a safe home 
like uh, for documentary lovers and filmmakers and stakeholders in the continent, which is mainly really the, 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 the longer term vision and goals. So we hope like in 20 years time or 30 years time, Doke will no need to be existing because that would mean that you have filmmaking communities that are strong in Kenya, Ethiopia and all over the continent. So this is in very few words what we do and why we're doing this, you have to, I may have to give you a little bit of explanation about uh, uh, the documentary on the continent. I mean, even the cinema in general, cinema started in Europe and the, in the States during the industrial revolution. Uh, and then when it came to the continent, uh, uh, people had brought the camera on the continent, they used the camera as a tool to explore the continent in order to exploit it. So basically from day one, cinema came as a tool for dispossession and it became a tool for soft power after the independence. You can name the French, uh, how the French funded West African cinema, for example. So, and now what you have, you have mainly financing from Northern institutions, mainly Europe. And we have two genres of documentary. We have the finance, the NGO finance doc, and the independent documentary film community. So the actual mapping of, uh, of documentaries on the continent shows to us, you know, this is our own data, like, like most than 50 to 55% of people coming to us are looking for production money. They're not looking for development, looking for money for production money. They come from all corners and angles of the continent, which means that they're looking to co-produce because there are very few film funds, national film funds, national broadcasters, and they're playing the game as well. So they're looking for co-producer as well. And the main co-producer come from Europe. The buyers and broadcasters who are looking at buying documentary content that are independent are the usual suspects, I would say. So in Europe, it's Arte, it's uh, BBC, it's Canal Plus, it's TV5 Monde, it's Al Jazeera, you name a few. In the States, it could be POV, PBS, the college and the streamers. So, but this will bring us to the vicious circle that the content is African, as far as the writer is concerned, as far as the filmmaker is concerned, as far as sometimes as the producer, but it is cut from local and national audiences. So, which means that revenue streams that could empower the writers and the producers is problematic. And so national broadcasters are not interested. So this is just to give you a, a, another view of what's happening with the genre. It's a burgeoning genre. It's one of the most accessible genre on the continent. It's also one it's, that is mostly represented in the major film festivals. And because we have uh, among the greatest African filmmakers, you have most of them, some of them are documentary filmmakers. I will name Samba Farings Diai, the, the Senegalese pioneers who started in the 70s. I could name Usman William Bay also from Senegal. I could name Jean Marie Tenou from Cameroon, Malik Ben Smile from Algeria, and you name it. So among the best filmmakers in the continent, they are documentary filmmakers. But that's the question, that's why we're here. So how do we make this sustainable? So we'll try to answer that, you, that question, Austin, who owns the yep. story and how we can move forward from that. That's, thank you very much for that, Mohammed, because you, you bring us, you just show us and shuttle us to the next, what, what we can discuss next, which is basically, from an artistic standpoint, and this I wanna, I wanna hear from Judy first. From an artistic standpoint, right? When we're discussing ownership, yes? And the ethics of ownership, right? And Mohammed brought it up like uh, the writers can be African, the protagonists can be African, but we realize sometimes that the producers, especially the main producer is not, and that now, you know, creates a debate between who actually has creative control over the, the final product. And you can speak about this, and I think you're the best person to speak about this first, because you are a filmmaker and you started a 
fund that supports filmmakers within the East African region. So you can give us both sides of the coin, I think. Judy, could you? <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. That's a big question. And I'm gonna try, as, as uh, Paddy said, to try and answer it as succinctly as I can. As a filmmaker who has made a number of films, that one thing became very, very clear. And that is he who often has the money decides who tells the story. And on the other hand, he who has the distribution who sees the story. And so as an African filmmaker, you find yourself really between a rock and a hard place, first trying to access those fundings. And by accessing the funding, you gain some of the control of your story. If your producer is African like you, they understand why you want to tell a story a certain way. Often there's a reason why the West will look at Africa in a certain way. Oh, Africa, why are you still so poor? It's because of the films that are being produced and the people producing these films and the way in which they choose to select films where audiences in the West might, may find them more marketable. They may be films with a white hero at the center. When for us, you know, we're not interested in making films that do anything other than reflect our very, very important journey. And so, is, is, is difficult to, to answer um, succinctly, but I think for me, I'd really say the importance of DOCA, the importance of DocuBox becomes that we have organizations where the producers who really decide on the story are able to, to support the filmmakers, authentic filmmakers from our continent. And also we're able to begin to start to come together to, to really network and, and decide um, how, how do we get these, these stories seen further abroad or further afield. Thank you, thank you, Julie. That was, that was as succinct as possible. And uh, I'd like to direct my next uh, question to Idrisu. Because in your experience being a filmmaker working from the diaspora and being African, right? What, 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 what issues have you faced in regards to, do you even have a right to make these stories because maybe perhaps you're not in the continent, right? Or in this case, they're questioning your, your, your ownership of your own heritage because you're not part of the day-to-day -day experience in Africa, right? So I would just like to hear from your point of view as a, a filmmaker from the diaspora, how, what challenges have you faced and how does that impact on your, your view of who should own the story or who basically owns it? I think you're muted, Idrisu. You're muted. I'm so, so sorry. Thank you, Austin. Um, yeah, I mean, this question is uh, it's, it's really uh, as complex and uh, um, and it it's really huge, right? So, um, but I want to go. I mean, even though I'm working and uh, from the you know from from abroad, I'm I'm still in Africa. And I'm, I'm working with African sens sensibility, right? And uh, all my films is all always about Africa. So I see things uh, really in the global you know uh, um, uh, sphere, right? In the more globally, right? How because we are all connected, right? African and and mm -hmm. it's uh, in African di diaspora, uh, we are talking about the same. Uh, the, the same 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 topic is we have the same concern right so i i'm going to talk about um i'm more interested in uh, in the ethical questions right uh, before talking about the ownership right what we own i i think it's the more important so what story we, we are telling right uh, mm -hmm. can, any african can just write a story and say, okay, and claim any ownership. Uh, but I think it's more important to talk about um, uh, what story we, we are telling today as an African, right? Uh, you know, having this experience uh, we, we, uh, our, our history has been distorted, right? By, by the West, right? And the story that we, 
uh, we know has been told until now are not our perspectives. So I'm concerned about how to correct all this um, uh, uh, misrepresentations, right? What story we tell before we, we re re reclaim the ownership, mm -hmm. uh, before we talk about how much are we earn uh, so from this story and who own producer and so on. Uh, so what story we, we are telling, right? So it's, uh, it's it's a complex question, right? And I personally don't think about uh, how much I I, I earn or how what is my ownership. I'm I I want to correct. You know, you can see all the film I I made until now is about uh, the representation of uh, Africans and uh, and and its diaspora. It's it's really difficult working from abroad and working with African sensibility, <laughs> sensibility, right? And returning to Africa mm -hmm. to shoot my film in Africa uh, while producing in Europe uh, with European money or even <laughs> world money, <laughs> right? And how to cope with, uh, you know, with producers who are not Africans, <laughs> right? Who are not necessarily Africans. And uh, I, 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 you know, I have the different experience because I used to work in Germany. I also work in France, and now I'm working from uh, from from uh, from the United States. So this is a different. It's a different each time you change the country, and uh, so um, this question. Um, I, I think we get time to develop things you know, yeah, to develop. But right now, uh, uh, the etiquette question are, are really uh, most important um, because I believe I'm. I'm, I'm a, a link, one link from a chain, right? And the chain is all these African uh, sensibilities we have received for generations, right? So claiming a ownership of something that you don't own, I believe I'm, you know, I, I'm, the story I'm telling, the story I tell, it's drawn directly from my ancestors, African ancestors, how to claim ownership from, 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 from that. So I think the best way to, um, uh, to pay tribute to all the members of the chain, I mean, African, our ancestors, is to tell great stories, great story and stories that values them, that correct the misrepresentation uh, in the international uh, uh, international um, uh, sphere. Right. You have to unmute your yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Idrisu. So. Um, you said something that really, really caught my um, caught my consciousness was that, um, of course, we are going to most of the we have to understand that Africa is part of a global community, right? But at the same time, it needs to shape its own identity. And you bring the element in the historical element that we. We, we've owned our stories because I'm sure Josh, I heard this from Josh before, um, that originally we were, we used to believe in oral tradition. So there was no specific person who could claim authorship of a story, yes? And in that case, I would like to direct to how I wanna hear her words on this. When you bring out ethics, right? In that we are part of a global, of, of a global sphere, which, is basically run on capitalism, right? Where we need to know who owns what, right? And who gets paid what, yeah? And here we are coming from a very long tradition as Africans where we own stuff communi communally. We, we belong to the society at large, right? And how do we wrestle with that, right? How do we wrestle with that? We wanna be part of the global playing field, but at the same time, it's sort of antagonistic to what we hold dear as a society, as a culture. What do you think, Howard? Massive question, not even. I'm sorry. It's very it's just, nebulous, it's just, but I'm going to attempt. So yeah. um, first of all, I do not think that Africa as a continent has, any, has ever been anywhere else but center. 
um, the conversation right now um, is going, is, oh, but you know, there's a new scramble for Africa. I think there was just a slight distraction and now it's just front and center again. Um, resource, the, the resources when we're talking, raw materials, human resources, and just perspectives have, have been from here. Uh, we are in the space of the past, speaking in this, with the space from which I work, which is East Africa, Kenya. Um, we have been working towards articulating ourselves. And that, as Judy touched on, has been a very interesting, tricky thing to navigate because you have an idea and a vision, but then how, how do you get your film made? It's not going to get made without money. Even though with the democratization of equipment and skill, there is still the fact that we need money to make films. And you, can, and you cannot do that without bumping up against the, the global, the global north. And it's like, well, in order to make this sellable, in order to make money back, in order to do this, there's this sort of contortioning that needs to happen while trying to own how you want to tell your story. And that makes you a really plasticine sort of individual while at the same time trying to maintain your integrity. So who owns mm -hmm. the story? Who are you asking? Are you talking about agency? Because if you're talking about personal agency and authorship, yes, me. But then if you're talking about ownership and fiscal remuneration, it's not that clear. Yeah? I could see. Yeah? And how Is do you think... Oh, how do I, sorry, continue. I think you get, you just, you just sort of compressed my question into something that I would love to invite Josh to comment on. Like, how do we search for that clarity? How do we, because at the end of the day, clarity is what's going to give us an opportunity to exploit our own stories, right? Understanding oh, the structure. Don't get me wrong, we do, but we do. Yeah. Over the past decade, I would say that we do. The question is, what version of our story is out there that we can agree with? Interesting. Wow. All right. So that that yeah. that's that's a very very powerful note from Howard. Like, what version of the story do we want to agree with? So, on that, Josh. Right. Do you think um, when we're looking at it from the element that at the end of the day, we as, as both the audience and the producers of the stories, right? Or the creators of the stories, do you think that agency is apparent or is it still a working progress? And if it is, what can we do to make sure that it's a bit easier for the next generation of filmmakers? Yeah, I mean, um... This question uh, of uh, the artistic issues and ethical issues involved in uh, considering this question of who owns the story is, uh, I think, rotates around two things, uh, the money and uh, the, the creativity. Yeah. So the word we own the story, yeah, I think must also be considered as a valid uh, response to that question. Uh, from from an ethical point of view, because uh, filmmaking, of course, is expensive. It's um, it uh, involves many people, and uh, all those people are going to make some kind of contribution to that story being told through film. So, in reality, everyone that is involved in making a film can claim some ownership. The fact is that ownership is not. Uh, a unitary concept. You can claim ownership uh, on something and so can someone else. And both of you would be right. So I think in terms of uh, the ethical issues of who owns the story, a number of people can own the story. That's, that's for sure. 
Artistically speaking, however, if you want to consider who owns the story artistically, it's got to be those who contributed uh, the maximum creative uh, content in that story. And of course, every story has, has a lot of creative content. Uh, the telling of a story involves highlighting certain things, um, rejecting, rejecting others, up. hiding I others, bringing to, to the four others, you know, putting emphasis on this, reducing emphasis on that, you know, and then the whole effect of the story is, is a very creative uh, thing. So certainly the person who contributes uh, the most creativity has the moral authority to claim that story artistically, yeah? But uh, in terms of the money, that would be someone else. That would be the person who puts their hand into their pockets and draws out some money which they will risk. That would be my answer. Okay. Um... Uh, I can see Idrisu had his hand up. Uh, unmute, please, Idrisu. Okay. Yes. I am. Yeah. I want to come come back again to to this question of ownership, and uh, and I mean also draw my my own experience about ownership. How conviction is really important first. Well, as a documentary filmmaker, knowing what story you want to tell is the very important, and how know how to defend this idea. No matter how, I mean, what, uh, what production, production or money you are working on, right? I, I, I make a film called I Lead the Second Paris, which was uh, about uranium um, uh, exploitation in, in Niger, right? Which was, I mean, uh, how, it's about our relationship the North and the South, right? And uh, how, uh, still we have, with this colonial power still, uh, 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 persisting in 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 africa right and the colonial exploitation of our raw material uh, is, uh, so um the question was how to get money uh from france uh, 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 even though the question i, I was uh, uh, tackling in, in this in, the, in this film was against that institution that belong to, to France, right? So um, I think if you have a conviction, you can always reach uh, your goal. You can tell the story you want to tell, right? So I don't believe first, I don't believe uh, on the fact that as African doesn't have money to produce uh, it on film. Uh, I, I don't believe the fact that, so we need Western money to make a film, that Africa need Western money to make a film, the film we are doing now. The problem, what is missing in Africa is organization and political will, right? So that's uh, a big a big pro problem in the, in, the, in the continent. You know, you see cars, um, yesterday you know, on, on, online I was seeing uh, in uh, Africa, one of African uh, African countries, a president who was just you know uh, traveling uh, within the country with more than fifty cars, fifty cars, a world president who traveling with fifty cars, right? So how could we? I mean, uh, complain that we don't have money? What do we? I mean, uh, that's uh, just a political way, okay? So that's the uh, one point. And the other point is, what story? we want to tell. And I mean, do we do, do we make comp compromise in this story, the story we, we want to make, right? It's, I mean, I'm working on a, on a new project and been uh, looking for funding for about seven years now. Um, and I'm defending my idea, my story idea. You know, I'm, I wanna tell it one story, not two, <laughs> not all the people's story, my story. And I'm going to wait until I tell, I be able to tell this story, right? So that's what it's about uh, in, in, in filmmaking. And if one day, <laughs> I don't know, Africa has, you know, we uh, realize that it's important, telling our story is important from our own perspective is important and then create, you know, uh, a funding film grant to, <laughs> to, to produce our film, then yeah, if I have to wait so long, yeah, I'm, I'm going to wait so, so long to tell this story, the story I want to tell, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Idrissa, that was really, 
that was really good, especially when you're sharing your own personal experience when you're doing so, when you're making your film, that is. Um, what I would love Mohammed to speak about, right? And um, and I know we, we, we're really eating up on our time, is Mohammed, your experience with co-production and how do you feel that impacts on whether we retain a level of ownership on our own stories and not just ownership at this point, if we could broaden the discussion too, whether we have an element of control, right? As how I was saying, um, the stories that that we, the versions that we want to see, do do the do, does the co-production element that is really the the norm within the continent? Do you think it's hurting, or this uh, or reducing our ability to version our own stories? I think thanks, Austin. Um, there's different ways to answer the question. The first one is to take it from a strictly artistic and ethical point of view. As a filmmaker, what you're trying to do, trying to get somebody who can help you make your film. We're very selfish people as filmmakers, just want to make the film. We think we can, we can change the world with our film. We're not going to change the world. That's not true, but we think we're going to change the world or our country or our village with a film. So we're trying to get the producer, wherever he is, if he's in Hong Kong, Brussels, Nairobi, anywhere, get the money, let me do a film, I'm going to change the world with it. So that's really the filmmaker point of view. And the filmmaker can gain control or, or maintain control because he's got some kind of a moral and ethical contract with his protagonist. Because when you go into reality, when you're filming a documentary filmmaker, what you do first is trying to trust He's trying to get to get the trust from your protagonist because you're basically going and asking people, I'm going to film you. They never ask to be filmed. And especially on a continent where people that have been coming for centuries to film us are film us like savage and roaches. And they are film us to exploit our images outside. And the image, which is why I'm insisting that image is still prevalent in the subconsciousness of the Western audiences and producers and streamers. And I will go even further. That image is prevalent with Western programs. And so it's going to take ages to get out of this and say, we African filmmakers, we filmmakers, we are filming reality. And it's complex. It's not complicated, but it's complex. So if you're filming reality in Paris, it's complicated, it's complex. If you're filming reality in Nairobi, it's also complex. We're human beings. So just to reach that level of conversation, you know, it's already hard for a filmmaker on the continent. And the second way where you can answer that is obviously in co-producing, because of all the other elements that I've been said now, Austin, is the money is up north and producers are working with broadcasters. They're putting pressure on them. So they're just me on my example, I've filmed four women for four years. And some, some broadcasters said, you know, we don't want the three other women. We want this one, which she's gay, she's bisexual, she's Muslim and you know, she's a bodyguard of the president. Just focus your story on that. Because that's, I'm ticking all the boxes there. And if I stay there, I'm sure the film would have had a much, much bigger impact. But it's not so the reality I wanted to film from my country. You see, so basically you're trying to maintain control by trying to have in your, your, your protagonist on board with you. But then that control, you know, escapes you when it comes to, you know, the distribution part, the selling part of the thing. And there's also one other element that we have to put in the mix, which is the global representation of ourselves. The global cinema is about representation. What is the global, you know, representation of Africa from the Western world? That yeah, we're poor. It's like. We know we fight, it's like we can get along. It's 
and this, from each other. why do we think why do we think this global representation will not permeate and invade the film industry it does the film industry would not be uh, 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 outside of that global representation you know because this is how the western world i mean 30 percent of the world's oil and minerals are in africa which means like billions and billions you know but 43 percent of the world's poorest are also in africa so we have the biggest riches and resources but we also have the poorest people that creates like kind of mindset for people when they're looking at our phones and images so it's a it's a really tough question to debate but we have to put that all those stuff to throw in and co-production becomes like a, a tool it's it's difficult what we're observing now you know just to be a little bit more optimistic we're observing um co-producers or european producers american producers are trying to, that are starting to understand where we're coming from but those are new generations, mainly coming from the African diaspora that lives in Europe, in the UK, in Germany, in France, or, you know, or, or, or in the States. Those are starting to understand our conversation. All right, thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, Idrissa, you have something to add? A quick one? Yes, yes, I just wanna add, uh, you know, follow up on uh, what, what Mohammed just said. Yes, uh, the question of representation is, is, is capital. It's a very, very important. That's what everything is about here, right? But uh, I, I wanna add uh, also one important aspect which is uh, we, you know, uh, around the co-production. Uh, Africa is the only continent that is dependent to, to I mean, <laughs> to money coming from abroad. You know, you can see, I mean, if you go, you, you, you go into, you know, you go back into history to see how Latin American film, film industry has developed now, or Asian film, film industry in Asia has developed. There were first a kind of dynamic within the continent itself, within the countries, there were kind of co-productions, uh, you know, collaboration yeah. within the continent. I think for Africa um, to be taken seriously by the world, uh, it's uh, to, I mean, to create this dynamic within the continent first, right? So that's, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to see, you know, have a, to, to see this movement, how Doc Africa is working now. Uh, that's a right direction, right? We cannot be dependent, 100% dependent from abroad. That's impossible. Right, uh, we cannot correct our representation while depend <laughs> dependent to to money coming one hundred percent from abroad. You know, we need to do first. You know, in the continent, we need to work. You know, we we need to be independent. We need to find a way to collaborate. You know, within, within the continent. You know, between countries. Right? You see, we, I mean, it's documentary film filmmaking is not different from from fiction in film industry. You can see in Nigeria now what is happening with Nollywood. You know, it's the same. They have the market inside. The first part of the market is inside the country, right? And the production, the production money comes, in, you know, from within the country itself. And I don't think a documentary production will be different. We need to do that first, and then when we succeed in that, you know, in this collaboration within the continent, we can, you know, we. I mean, we can. That's it. it's about interest. It's about money. It's about market, right? If people know, partners know that they can make money while investing in African history uh, stories. You know, they will come. They will come from any, you know, from different places in the world. But right now, what we are doing, it's just we are begging for, for money, right? We, our stories are not, you know, uh, marketable. The, I'm not saying it's not marketable. For them, it's a, are not marketable because we don't have this market in, inside the continent right now, right? We don't have this, uh, this market. Once we get the market, once we have this dynamic, once we have this production, uh, the productions we need, and we see that uh, you know the cup productions we are starting from the end <laughs> instead of starting <laughs> yes from, from, from within right so that's uh, what, <clears throat> what i want to add 
Thank you very much, Idrisu. And uh, you've, you've brought in a, a new dimension that really brings us, I really want to hear how it's taken this because I've heard her speak about it before and she was very passionate about it. And in this case, um, Mohammed talked about control and, uh, and, and Idrisu brought in the element of us trying to collaborate within the continent itself. However, we, we can't ignore the fact that we are looked at as a continent. As you said, we are front and center. We are the source in essence, but there is also this influx of content and stories from other parts of the world that are being more pervasive within the continent and create and influencing the younger generation to define themselves using another person's lens or perspective. So Howard, do you think that sort of creates a problem in how we start defining ourselves as Africans? And it also brings in the question of our agency, right? And, you know, knowing who we are and knowing what we want to say, because we have constantly faced with a different reflection of what we need to be. So where we are, you're right. We have an influx of content from everywhere. Predominantly, I would say um, America, followed closely by India and then, um, and then Europe. And that has educated what we consider good television, good film, good, what, what is considered an aesthetic, it's a particular aesthetic. And that soft power that Mohammed was talking about earlier has permeated our brains so deeply, especially when you, when you see and you realize that what it is that, how it is that we are portrayed in this, through this lens, is so unfavorable, so on the back foot, that we have a lot of catching up to do. A lot of catching up to do in not just how we tell our stories, but, but with, but I suppose with, with what sort of aesthetic and production value becomes very, very important in this, in that conversation. Um, our agency, <laughs> um, how we articulate ourselves from my perspective in a way that I want to be seen because I have to figure out exactly how I can tell my story from my perspective in a way that I feel will echo to, to you, Austin, I guess. Um, while still finding a way to go to market because it might as well be dead if it doesn't go to market. I mean, I have deeply romantic notions about making the film that I want to make um, resources be damned and I've done it. Um, and those films, uh, while they had an audience, I think maybe 50 people saw them, you know, um, even when it is that I put them up for free on YouTube. So there is a game, there is a game afoot of pushing as far and wide as possible while expressing that story in a way that has as wide a reach as possible. And that is its own agency as well as the story that you're telling. And oh. the importance of that cannot be underestimated. It, it needs, you have to become, what's the word? Brutal in your ownership to push the agenda of your own story as you see yourself. Otherwise, someone else is going to tell you how you're supposed to see yourself. And that's what we're dealing with. Judy. Judy was was on that story from the get-go. Judy, could you, could you say something to us? Yeah, I saw something yeah. burning. Yeah, I think I'm burning. Guys, 
I'm like this, I'm burning because I feel like there's something that is uh, we're kind of going around in the conversation. It, we're sort of sounding like, oh God, we want money so bad and we need to work harder. I'm not liking that narrative. I'm not liking it <laughs> because over the past nine years, I have worked with brilliant filmmakers. Yeah, mm. as a filmmaker myself, who who founded and run a, and runs with filmmakers a fund for African filmmakers by African filmmakers, I cannot count enough of the stories that have come out that are award winning, that have traveled, and that are soaked in blood, sweat, and tears. And I'm not joking. You know, sure. honestly, you look at a film like The Letter. That film took six years to make. It has won a in Barcelona. Where are this, you know, this myth that that we're not creating this this incredible work is, is not quite true. I think the thing that we need to understand is that there is not quite a level playing field here. The minute that you don't, we don't have our own broadcasters clamoring and, and projecting and putting our story on air, it's not that easy to go to the Netflixes or to, it doesn't matter how many awards you've won. Look at Softy, another film that we supported, seven years in the making, opened in Sundance, won a prize. You know, who, who, who can say that these are not hardworking, exceedingly talented filmmakers? Look at New Moon by Philippa Herman. Again, six years in the making, we supported that one top prize at Durban in Cairo, best artistic. These are, I, I can go on actually, these are not the only examples I have, you know? And so really we cannot emphasizing that there are factors that we are pushing back against. When we compare to Nigeria, for instance, it's easy, it's always done. How many are they? Yeah. And are we talking fiction or documentary? Because this is a documentary conversation. And I want to see those documentaries in Nigeria, which are doing brilliantly and raking in that kind of money and getting the kind of support that their fiction does. Yeah, the conversation will become a bit thinner there, you know? <laughs> so we have to look at documentary as a genre, which is complicated. It is exceedingly difficult and, and lonely to make a documentary film. And Many filmmakers will keep doing other gigs, putting that money back into the films that they make. So it's not that it's this group of, of sort of um, begging, desperate filmmakers. These are people with passionate, with very important stories to tell, but finding it very difficult to keep going. And yet they do. And yet these films. This is important. Dokka, you know, Mohammed over there, I, I see. I see somewhere out there uh, producers in Dava. Yeah, I saw them somewhere. Um, again, you know, a group that will 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 look and say we need to 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 pull, pull together a whole network of African producers and exchange information. These conversations. This is how it begins. This is how we change things, because documentary has a much bigger social capital payback. It may not rake in the box office money. Uh, but it still takes a lot in time, blood, sweat and tears to make. And it needs a network of us, of us, you know, convinced and, and, and pushing it and making sure not just our broadcasters, but other global broadcasters realize that there's something really special going on in this continent. That's what wow. I was burning to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I, I, <laughs> before, before, before we go to Idris, I just wanted some, uh, just, just, uh, speak to what judy has has brought in you i feel like you've summed up the the spirit of what it takes to make a film not just a documentary a film within the continent because it requires if, if i'm to use a colloquialism you require a mad tough. hustle you need to really move things around yeah and that's the reality of the continent is that we may not have the structures of the Western world, but we do make but do we're with what doing we have, it. And we're know? doing it. We are doing it. Yes. Yes. And just you wanted to say something, and I hope it's short. Yes, I yes. I, I, I you know, I just want to add, continue, you know, in the in this direction. Um, yeah, how I mean, first, first of all, I think African the continent is too big, 
right? The African continent. That's a, right the problem because we discuss everything in terms of continent. You know, we are not talk, talking, you know, in terms of country, right? So, and so that's a, a kind of handicap. It's a good thing. It could be also a handicap, right? So, you know, walking, you know, in the, in, mm -hmm. you know, as a global, you know, two thousand uh, languages. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like two thousand languages. Yes, you know, yes, two thousand languages, and uh, and uh, <laughs> more than fifty yeah. different countries, different law, right? So I mean, you can see how uh, African artists, African filmmakers are lonely, so too lonely, right? That's a big problem, you know, with a producer. That's a very big problem, and uh, we're talking also about funding, grant, and so on. You know, M. Um, Every country has a problem of with funding and grant. You know, you can see, but they they, they found ways. Right to create this ground to find it, you know, with the political will. You know, um, France has also problem with Hollywood films. Germany has the same problem. Uh, different countries have the same problem with, uh, you know. But they found the law, right? You can see some countries like France or Germany. They have a kind of post percentage of Hollywood film that can be screened in, in the country, and they have they found a way to let. I mean to oblige Hollywood film industry to fund the national film industry in the way a certain percentage of the ticket, the ticket price goes into the production. Are we, <laughs> are we able to, you know, uh, as a continent to do, to find such law in the country, uh, in, in Africa? That's a, that, that's a big problem. How could we Imagine a law that's, I mean, a law that can, for instance, oblige any foreign film, uh, uh, you know, uh, to fund African filmmakers, African film farm, for instance. How do we do that? Okay, um, I have something to say to that. Yeah. Before, I'm sorry. Yeah, Austin, go ahead, yeah. Uh, our I will just, just finalize, I think, just as a response before I can sum up the discussion with, uh, with Josh. Okay, so what oh, I wanted yeah. to say is, in order for in in order for that to be the case, Idrisu, we have to get to the point where film, at least again, I will talk about East Africa because that's what I know. It needs to be considered a serious venture, a serious business, not just a vocational entity, in order to start lobbying, which I'm really happy to say has started to happen. And simply because something worked in one country does not mean that it's a copy and paste for another. I'm really happy to say that with the work that DocuBox and Doka are doing, that not only are filmmakers given space to do the work, but that markets, audiences are being built for, work, for the work that is being made, which is what needs to happen in order for, for us to close the circle, to actually have a conversation worth having about bringing to the table and saying, listen, this is what we need to happen in this situation, lobbying government. It's, but it's, we, we, are, we are at the stages of where this is happening. It's, it's taking longer than, it, than we would like, but I think with regards to this, it will always take longer. Why has it taken so long? Why are we here? Goodness, I mean, we could unpack that for several other sessions, but the fact is we are where we are and the progress is happening. Sure. And we can't ask for more than that. Thank I mean, you sure, very we much. Could, but we put. That's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a wonderful parting shot, Howard. We are, we are where we are, All right? Um, Josh, I love the way you're able to break down complex notions and concepts. And this is why I would love you to speak about the solutions that are being developed. Um, the, the, the of course, we've discussed the challenges. We've heard, we've heard what's going on, but I think you're, you're in a good place to speak about the, what we, ex, what, what we envision are the solutions. Having been involved with both Docker and DocuBox, I think you can harmonize um, and sum up our discussion at this point. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Austin. I mean, uh, when I, I get very passionate when I talk about documentary because uh, I know it's a very hard genre and uh, it doesn't make a lot of money at the box office because it's not as popular as uh, fiction film, which is uh, dealing with escapist uh, 
concepts and uh, creations, uh, whereby uh, documentary is talking or dealing with the uh, reality, hard things, hard things that people uh, should see and it should influence them, but um, uh, they don't necessarily, well, the general audiences in the public don't necessarily want to go and watch, but certainly documentary is extremely important because um, I've long thought about it as uh, a cultural infrastructure, which is very similar to the physical infrastructure that exists in most countries and needs to be developed in most countries. So uh, documentary is uh, a, a very important component of that uh, cultural psychological infrastructure of any country, yeah? I mean, you could say, um, you could say like uh, Patricio Guzman said, you know, a country uh, without, uh, you know, documentaries like a country without uh, a photo book or, you know, a, a photo album or something like that. So it's, you know, I mean, it's fundamental. It's fundamental to the- Photograph album. Cohesiveness, yeah. to the cohesiveness of any country. So in that respect, the one thing that uh, we as activists, cultural activists uh, must do, we must make sure that the people who are charged with leadership in some of these countries through uh, democratic fiat need to understand the importance of documentary film in their countries. This is a very hard task to do. It's not easy, but it must be done. And certainly in some of these organizations that exist, such as uh, DocuBox and Docker, this must be one of the primary things that they're trying to do. They must always be reaching out to those people who are making the decisions as to how their country's monies are dispersed. Instead of buying 50 cars for their president to ride on a motorcade, fund some storytellers, fund some documentary filmmakers, yeah? A car, a car uh, like like one of those uh, huge Mercedes uh, uh, Benz luxury cars, and uh, <laughs> can can probably tell ten stories and distribute them to 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 a million people, and that'll change the future of that country in one way or another, according to the stories that are told. So that's one thing I feel very strongly about that we as cultural activists certainly need to be doing. Mm -hmm. Wow, Josh. Wow, that was rousing. <laughs> <laughs> that was rousing. <laughs> Where do we sign up? <laughs> Here. Right now. <laughs> On the chat. <laughs> All right, I think uh, right now we, we're going to have, uh, we're going to move on into our, oh, Mohammed, your hand is raised. Mm -hmm. Mohammed, you had something yeah. to say? Yeah, I wanted to talk about the solutions, you know, great intervention yeah. by Josh. I wanted to say that, you know, uh, there are solutions. And I mean, the fact that Pan-African film funds, like we exist as Doke, DocuBox, as other funds, Sofika, uh, Fopika in Senegal, all the funds, for example, there are lots of funds, lots of doc organizations on the ground. I mean, solutions are coming. There are also solutions because right now wherever you are on the continent elsewhere you you have the possibility of documenting your own life which means that for mm -hmm. us which means that you know african citizens today is going to be more difficult for external i come back to my initial presentation of people coming from the west to come with a camera and tell them this is how we're going to to portray you because they're already documenting their own lives, which makes like there's, there's an awareness about how we represent ourselves to the world. And there's also this movement of filmmakers, of cultural activists, of film organizations that's coming up. And all this at the same time makes like for the future is very bright because we're also talking about a uh, uh, if you have on a macro level, it's a very young continent. I think the uh, medium age is between 20, 22, you know, and I'm talking from the Comoros, the medium age is 20 years old. So we're talking about a, uh, a young continent 
And the youth here are documenting themselves through social media, whatever. And, and next to that, we have filmmakers who have become social activists, cultural activists, entrepreneur. So we have like some kind of movement that's happening, which is almost like, it's just, it's silent, but it's coming. You have some national film funds, you know, and the decisions, and we're going to reach mm. a level where we're going to have a multiplicity of films because this is the level we need to reach. The more films we're going to have from Kenya, not just from our or Judy, but from hundreds of our and hundreds of Judy, the, be the better it's going to be. And we are going to, we going that, that way. And I think those are the solutions. And then of course, the West has to look at themselves and say, how am I viewing the other? Because this is, we, we're talking also about, you're making a film for people to look at your own reality. How am I viewing Africa? How am I viewing African women? How am I viewing a black person? You know, uh, uh, post-colonial, stuff, uh, are they still there in my mind, consciously or, or subconsciously? How I can do better co-production and be into fair trade? And the West also has to look at itself. And if they're not, I mean, the movements that are there coming from the diaspora, from the cultural activists there are going to force them to look at themselves as well. All right. Thank you very much for that, Mohammed. And I think it's time to invite our lovely audience to uh, ask their questions. Please make sure you raise your hand digitally so that our team can be able to see you and highlight you for your question. All right, and keep it as short and brief as possible so that everybody can have a chance to speak. We have Kole Odutola. Yeah, thank Colette. you very much. I, I don't even know which of the questions to start with, but I must say that um, a, um, a hey historical, when we do not put things into historical context, sometimes it looks as if mm. what is in the mm. present has no bearing with, with the past. Um, I, have, I have been working with um, the people who did Countdown at Kusini, I mean, I wish that you could just study the model in which these African-Americans had planned to use. Yes, I know it was not documentary. It was a feature film. Please go and look at what Ossie Davis and all the others were trying to do to solve the question as far back as 1973, to solve the question of uh, funding and distribution of films made by, Africa, or by Africans and stories told by Africans. And, Please read how that was frustrated. That's one side of it. The second side of it is that the cultural policy in Nigeria, as much as it's a, it's a beautiful document that has not been operationalized, we need to look into the cultural policies of different African countries and ask ourselves the question, what is the film policy? In the Nigerian cultural policy, if anybody wants it, I'll send it to you. I have worked on it for, I've worked with it for years. And in there are documentaries. And if you look at the story of Nigeria and documentary, you would see that somebody like Chief Shagolushola had actually had some kind of workings with the Germans. Um, there was the singer who also had Nigeria as continent of riches. Nigeria actually started off with documentaries. And right up till mm -hmm. now, a certain brother, Femi Odubemi, is in the forefront of that. But I, yeah. I cannot speak for Femi Odubemi because he speaks for himself. He's very well known. The person you do not know, and I wish you all know, is a guy called Johnny Muteba. Johnny Muteba is based in South Africa. He's from Congo. He does documentaries. He's, he's working with the American Chamber of Commerce. So there are some things we might not know. And there are some things that if you bring the history to the present, it might make a world of difference. So then my last point, you were all, there was this talk about um, ownership and everything seemed to be monetized. The Africa, and you know that this Africa is East Africa. This Africa that um, the representation and the participation here is mostly East Africa. 
the story is different from North Africa that most of us neglect, or even the Sub-Saharan Africa, by the time you get to South Africa, Ghana has actually had a debate and a dialogue about the question of even the diasporan Ghanaians using the folklore and asking them to pay. The Africa that I know deals more with social capital. How our people contribute to the making of films. If you want to know anything about Nollywood, Nollywood started by advertising, by um, designer companies giving clothes to be used in exchange for publicity. I think I should just stop there because the, the whole um, uh, landscape of documentary filmmaking is such a thing that speaks to the heart of who we are and where we can go. I teach mm -hmm. at the University of Florida here and I teach a, a, um, a course called Africa Through Film. And that's why this is so important to me. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. That was awesome. No. Could we have Anna Briggs? Sorry, I was muted. Anna Briggs? You can ask your question Hi. now. Hi. That was, um, so that was an amazing <clears throat> contribution. Oh, thank you, yes. Uh, I'm a um, film archivist, so I'm always interested in the, the heritage side of things. And I wanted to know um, if you were aware of any organizations in sub-Saharan Africa that uh, specialize in collecting documentary film, if any of the panelists uh, have any suggestions. Um, I think, Mohammed, uh, you could answer that one, please. Anna, please write to us. I think they have the email, info at Documentary Africa, and uh, you don't have institution per se, you have the Pan-African Federation of Filmmakers that I'm, I'm, I'm a, a member, but you, I will also direct you to some uh, researcher and some archivists that are really working on that subject and film professionals as well. But just write to us, the email is in the chat, and then we'll uh, give you some contacts and we can chat further. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, we have Ryan Carty. Ryan. Uh, hello, good afternoon or good evening, wherever everyone is. I just want to thank each of the panelists. Um, so I think it was Josh's comment that um, it's a great note too. And it was the idea that a number of people can own the story, but artistic wise, the ones who gave the maximum creative content own the story. And you were speaking upon the lines of, it's the idea that you you're be highlighting, rejecting, emphasizing, decreasing the emphasis. So I think what I need, or what I'm asking, <laughs> apologies in advance, is the idea of what is the idea of who gives the maximum creative content? Is it those that are the directors for it? Is it the exhibitors? Is it by chance the characters or main or protagonists? that we follow along the documentaries. So I guess I just need, I just, I would like to ask for the emphasis upon that. Mm -hmm. oh, hi, hi, Ryan. Uh, thanks, thanks for your question. It's, uh, it's, it's a really, really good question. And I think it's been touched on by both Idrisu, uh, who talked about conviction, conviction about the story that you want to make. And I think that's a very important component in the creation of any story. The person with the most conviction will invariably be the one who's spending most, the most time and the most creative uh, energy, uh, shall we say, in the creation, in the formation of this story, in the telling of this story. So I think it's, uh, you know, you, you can pretty much tell that there's someone who's driving this story, who's definitely going to make sure that it sees the light of day. And perhaps uh, either Idrisu or even Judy and Mohammed and Hawa, who are filmmakers and uh, have made uh, many films, can also uh, say something important uh, uh, towards this question that you've asked. Thanks, Ryan. Um... Yeah, Idrisu? 
You're muted. I always have, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, in, as a documentary filmmaker, it's difficult really to say who is the most important uh, person in, in a film. Uh, it's about people's story. We are telling uh, people's stories, community stories, right? And uh, without the collaboration of these people, uh, the film will never, you know, exist, right? So I, I don't want to claim any ownership as a, as a, as a documentary film filmmaker. It's a really a, um, our, as, let's say, individualist capitalism, you know. Uh, way to think right about story you know i even though we need money to make it to make a film i want to talk more about re how the story you know is translated into a film right so every person in the, in the process is is important right if uh, someone you have a character who refused to collaborate there's no film <laughs> there's no film it's, it's about the reality here we are telling people's story Right, so um, I'm I'm just part of uh, of of a collective of a collective uh, uh, collective work. So I, even though you know internationally or nationally we are defending, we, are, we say I mean that's uh, something you know everyone do. Uh, or that's my film. If you buy it, we sue. But I don't I don't really believe in that. Or you know produced by this person, it's. It's something that's actually new for us African uh, Africans. I think, I, right? This own, you know, and personal ownership of thing, right? Uh, it's about making money, and uh, uh, that, that's what is. I mean, I don't think it's, the documentary is about that, right? All right, Judy, you had something to say? Yeah, um, yeah, I do. I, I think I, I want to point to a specific e example. Um, of, of, of why I feel you know the director is so important in the film and, and also for having the right creative producer by their side, because that's the person who, you know, they will walk on fire for that story. They will, you know, they will forget to, to, to eat because that story needs to see the light of day. And, and, and directors who don't have a strong creative producer who, believes in where they're coming from, find that journey very difficult. And I want to speak about one of the films that, that we supported, um, where, in, you know, in search of this, this money, um, you know, took on uh, a, a UK based executive producer. And, you know, without, I won't name what this, this film was, because there may be some legalities around it. But this producer thought it was hilarious that there were gay men in Kenya playing a certain sport. But it, of course, it was not a hilarious film. You know, this is a subject where uh, to be gay is, 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 is a thing that could be the difference between life and death. And yet that is what you are. And he, you know, and this, this uh, European producer was determined that this documentary must have and was dangling lots of additional um, funding on the condition that the director changed the tone of the door. It was just disgusting, to be honest. Um, and, and I think there, right there, it was very easy to see who owned that story. It was the team that fought for that story, that understood the importance of that story, that, that was making the story because they had a reason. They were making it because they, they knew who, who they were making it for. And, and you know, despite the, the difficulty of extracting themselves from this relationship, they were happy to wave goodbye to that financing and continue with nothing if that was what it was going to take to tell their story. And so for me, the person ultimately who owns the story is the one who will fight for the story because they see it so clearly in their mind that they will ensure they are the guardian of, of that story and they will ensure that that story is. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mohammed, you have something to add? Mohammed. Yeah, for me, um, documentary, it depends on the, on the technique used because we're talking about art here, uh, which is uh, very interesting because it's, an, it's a genre and within that genre, you have different techniques. I mean, me, I use cinema verite, which is, means that I, 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 uh, I follow protagonists for long periods. And I can stay like 
you know, for a whole day shooting, 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 and waiting for something to happen. Sometimes nothing happens. But, uh, for, and for me, at, there's a stage where you arrive and it's the story that owns you because the story has its own power, you know, and the story has its own power. And because it owns you, you have to, you have to, you have to listen to the story. And, you know, because the, the story has its own dynamics. You talk talking about reality. So I say, I'm going to film our, you know, in Diani at 2 p.m. Arrive at 2 p.m., our is not there because she's going around in her life. So I'm going to go where she is. <laughs> and, you know, and she may be in a totally different mind frame than the one we've talked about. And then she doesn't want to answer my questions anymore. But what I do, I keep filming. Till maybe like three, four hours later, she's in the right mind frame, and then my story can evolve a little bit. So for me, at some point, when you're in the creative process of filmmaking, you know, the story owns you in documentary. And that's the power of documentary mm. contrary to fiction. In fiction, you have the script, the scenario is there, don't move from a line because that's money. <laughs> you know, yeah. so for me, the story owns you. <laughs> that would be my answer, really. Drisa, I'll have to cut you short a little bit. We have one more question. Yeah, one okay. Question okay. okay. Lani. Lani, could Lani please come to the fore? And let's be, let's be brief and straight to the point so that we can also do that with the response. Right. Um, thank you very much for the presentation so far. Um, I just, I just want to add to and what Idrisu had, had mentioned, which I, I really thank you for bringing that part of um, ownership up, because I, I strongly feel too that um, by putting so much emphasis on ownership, we are kind of maybe unwittingly subscribing to that capitalist notion of copyrights and internet, um, um, what's it called now, IP, because really, can we look at it as ownership of the telling of it as opposed to ownership of the actual story, which would likely have pre-existed the film. And so in that sense, the story still belongs to those who created it, who own it legitimately. And you as the teller, you own the telling of it in the way you are telling it, but you don't own the story. And secondly, if I may just mm -hmm. add, I also think we should remember that the entire film industry globally is first of all a business, right? Cinema making. And the history of filmmaking globally is littered with attempts by Hollywood and more generally the West to own it and control the structure. So when, when we always have this at the back of our mind, we understand that even by default, they are pushing alternative cinemas and alternative attempts out of the way and out of the system, even by default. So maybe, the, maybe one of the answers to how we make films in Africa without so much being reliant on them is, how do we just shake off the demands or the expectations of what a documentary should look like and just make it? Even when we make films and the audio isn't all, all good throughout the, throughout the process, just slap it on it that way. Yes, it's not, standard, it's not the standard that we would expect, but it's still a documentary. It's still something we have documented and it's there for posterity. So we're not always looking to satisfy some expectations and some, some size of the audience pool before we go into it. We just make it anyway and not have to consider if it fits what's expected globally. That's my contribution. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Lani. Yeah. Idris, I, I'm gonna put you next, but what okay. I'm gonna ask is I want you to also give me your takeaway in the process. When you're, when you're giving your final, your, your comment, just also give us your takeaway from the, from the discussion at a whole, then we can, we can proceed that way. What do you think? Great. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I just want, want to say that, uh, I mean, this question, the way we have for you ask the question about ownership is, uh, is uh, you know, I let me think about also, um, the African raw material, African raw material exploitation, really. It's a complex, really, uh, as complex as, uh, you know, this question of uh, uh, ownership 
you know, uh, in film, it's a, it's 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 complex as the, as the issues of uh, African raw material. I mean, which benefits uh, you know the rest of the world except uh, African themselves, right? So if we continue thinking about ownership and the, this notion, you know, um, the person who intervened uh, before, you know, he's, he's summarized in a, you know in a, in a, in a nice 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 way, right? I. I think we have to, to think carefully if we continue, if we will believe and follow the way in the ownership is defined in the West, right? Monetizing ownership, right? And uh, forgetting uh, 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 the collective, <laughs> collective a, a, a notion of ha on owning things in Africa. That is something we can add to the international uh, 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 notion of uh, ownership. We should not forget where we come from and to what value we as African we receive at home. That's a, it's a strength. It's not you know we should not forget uh, 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 this um, how to say heritage we have that uh, we don't see the world in an individual way, but as, as, as a collective, as a group, right? And uh, also this cinema uh, should also be approached with this heritage, right? So that's uh, uh, what I wanna add, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Idrisu. Uh, our time is moving faster than our passion. So I would love to have one sentence, one takeaway from Judy, right? And one takeaway from Mohammed, one sentence each, and then we can wrap it up. Okay, I'm gonna to refer to something actually that Mohammed said that I just absolutely love and I'm gonna hold it in my heart, Mohammed. Um, and that is, you know, with the documentary, The Story Owns You. You know, that is ultimately true. As Africans, we in this community, um, with this sort of collective way of working, I think we need more to work together as organizations. Uh, I think we're beginning to do that. And I'm, I, this is wonderful to see that. But I think we need to know that we are part of the world. <laughs> from the world. And so we do need to ask, you know, who owns the story financially otherwise someone else out there somewhere will own it for us thank you very much judy mohammed oh so um, i'm very optimistic i think what we're witnessing on the continent something that has never happened before the emergence of uh, structures of uh, producers living on the continent of filmmakers of festivals of film funds, of uh, activists. And this is something that's happening right now as we're talking. And this is the first time in the history of African cinema that we have all those components that are starting to merge and connect, West, North, East, Central. And um, I'm very optimistic. And this also gives me hope because I think the way the world is going, we, we as independent filmmakers all over the globe, we are connected now, which is, wasn't something that was possible maybe 20, 30 years ago. We are all connected because what we've discussed today, I think some of those issues, filmmakers, documentary filmmakers in Brazil, in Chile, in Paris, in, in Slovenia, wherever they can relate to them. So, so that gives me hope. And I hope that for the next generation of listeners who are in the West, that they can stop and reconsider the connection within the continent, with the continent. And I think that gives, that gives me hope. Thank you very much, Mohammed. And that I believe sums up our discussion and I can pass it on to Patty to, to, final, to finalize everything now, I believe. Yes, and uh, I'd like to, on behalf of the Park Center for Independent Media, the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival, Cine Documental, um, 
And a, thank, uh, a big thank you to our partners for this event, uh, Documentary Africa and uh, DocuSeek. Um, I'd like to thank our chat wranglers, uh, Hannah and Jeremy, who did incredible pull quotes and links for our international audience. I'd especially like to thank all of our presenters uh, for your insight, your depth of thinking, um, and your passion, Hawa, Judy, Josh, Adrisu, and Mohammed. And I'd really like to thank Austin for his wonderful moderation of this roundtable where I've learned a new phrase, our passion exceeds our time. I'm going to give <laughs> a shirt for that. Um, and I'd like to ask everybody still on screen to unmute, including all of our participants. And we'd like to give everybody a real live, not virtual round of applause for this extraordinary event. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.